Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Um, my name is Tom Langston. Um, I'm a digital learning and teaching specialist at the University of Portsmouth. And joining me today uh, for this presentation is Stuart Sims, who Hello. is. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't sure if that was on cue to introduce myself. Yeah, so I'm Stuart Sims, uh, also from the University of Portsmouth. So I'm a senior lecturer in higher education, which largely means I teach on our academic professional apprenticeship and things like that. Uh, so today, if I get the application sharing going, um, the session is called Co-Creating Expectations. Um, Stuart and myself have been working on this. Um, Stuart's been working on co-creation elements, and he'll, he'll explain more of that as we go through uh, for a lot longer than I have. Uh, but for the kind of duration that we had for lockdown and now coming out of that, um, we've been working very closely together on on sort of supporting academics supporting uh members of staff within the university and and looking at how we can use tools to support uh sort of co-creation as a uh, kind of an event and a, a something that's going going forward so um in the chat i see people putting questions please do uh put them there because there's two of us we'll try and sort of jump in and answer them as we go and if not we can obviously do a bit uh, a q a at the end as well um and yeah, so hopefully you'll find something useful today. So to start with, we're using VVox um, to kind of demonstrate some of this. So if you can go to on your phone or another web tab, vvox.app, and use the code that you can see on screen, which is 109647302. Although you can download the app, you don't need to for this. You can just do it on a web browser. They both um, both work uh, sort of perfectly uh, perfectly well. And on the slides that this is uh, going to be relevant for, the code will reappear. So if you don't get it yet, uh, we can add that bit back in for you as well uh, as we're going. So uh, this, this, the first one here is what word or words come to mind when you hear co-creation? Um, bear in mind with the VVox word cloud, you don't, it doesn't accept sentences or phrases. So you, again, I fully understand maybe people, people have a, uh, an idea of something in the, in a longer context but at the moment just single words or if you use an underscore you can do, do it that way to get a, a smaller phrase in there and thank you for the code Stuart. yes and the code is uh, as you can see uh, at the top here as well 109-647-302 uh, so got a minute to to put this in so while you're thinking about your responses uh, to this question that Tom's thrown up, we'll just give a bit of context. And obviously, we could have just asked you for your thoughts in the chat, but we want to be talking today about how we've been using and how we've been supporting others to use audience response systems of various kinds of Portsmouth to facilitate co-creation activities through, between staff and students. Um, we'll draw on some specific examples, but we're not going to get too bogged down in, in the details because we want to be sharing a bit more sort of transferable practice. We're going to get you doing a few activities in a few different uh, audience response systems. Uh, we've got VVox here, we'll be using Padlet later as well. Um, their usage, uh, as we're going to be doing here, isn't necessarily that novel in terms of the, the technical sides of things. I know this is an alt presentation, so you might be expecting something very driven by the tech, but this is very much an attempt to just try and get you to think about tools you might be familiar with already, how they can be used to stimulate different kinds of discussions. So generative curriculum design discussions with students. Um, I'll stop waffling over the dead air and let Tom walk you through uh, what's on the screen. Well, uh, I, I think as you were just sort of alluding to there, Stuart, uh, the, the big one that's come come out is collaboration. Um, so it, it definitely is that kind of, with what we've been doing and what we're trying to sort of promote today, is is it definitely that that co collaborative idea of what you can do with your the, the colleagues that you maybe support or the students that you teach. And in some cases, like for people like myself, the students that I teach are the colleagues that we support as well. It's a kind of a Venn diagram. Um, so it's quite interesting uh, to see we've got challenging in there um but inclusive uh, partnership creativity is there anything that stands out for you Stuart um yeah challenging stood out and I think we'll we'll return to that at the end so we're uh, we'll try and leave some time for discussion we're not a huge group today so certainly through the chat or maybe through a muting later on we can have pick up some of the areas where where 
there are challenges. Um, but I think these are all the kinds of words I would have probably said, and we'll move on to, to some definitions just to set the context, which will pick some of that up as well. Thank you, Thomas. Very smooth. Uh, so um, this one from uh, Bovel and colleagues so sums up a lot of what was on the previous slide. The co-creation ultimately is when staff and students work together collaboratively to create components of the curriculum or pedagogic approaches. And we'll we'll pick up a lot of examples that are more faced at the bottom one here, the pedagogical approaches. And as the name of the session indicates, one of the things that we've been encouraging and supporting and doing ourselves uh, in, in our practice uh, at Portsmouth over the last 18 months or however long uh, COVID has been going on now is, is around setting expectations of how engagement should be managed and delivered and that's expectations for staff and expectations for students about what you do and why in a classroom and how you do it and where that's going and co-creating these elements is a, is a good example of how to get students engaged from the very beginning and hopefully begin to address some of those challenges we've all been facing uh, having to teach unexpectedly uh, remotely uh, all of a sudden um, it's worth saying when I'm, I'm talking about co-creation that I think a lot of people, certainly a lot of the literature in the past pre-COVID, because it is collaborative, it is based on ideas like what else did we have in the, the word cloud? Um, teamwork, uh, for example, these things are certainly for me, uh, they conjure ideas of they're face to face there because these things are generative. They're about you working with a group of people quite often co-creation is with a small group of, of, of students. So maybe student reps, maybe just the, the keen students, it can be whole cohort, we'll pick up some of that later. But I think a lot of colleagues who I know at Portsmouth, when COVID happens, they who do good work co-creating with the students, collaborating with students to design curriculum, to design pedagogic approaches, they, they almost just immediately assumed that that was done or at least on pause uh, for the COVID time. So what Tom and I have been trying to do is to just try and lift those kinds of good practice that were happening across the institution anyway and suggest some alternative ways that you could manifest that, that you could manage that, that you could undertake that through a more remote uh, but still hopefully interactive uh, method. Um, you could just skip two slides ahead to the ladder, Tom. Uh, Whoa, oh, three slides ahead. <laughs> That's the one. Um, sorry, I should have maybe took the, the first part of the slides myself. So um, this may be familiar, familiar to some of you. It's been around um, for a little, a little while. Uh, but um, Bovell and Bully developed this ladder in 2011 to try and understand where students can participate in cur curriculum design. And what the examples we're going to uh, share with you. They, they've tried to aim different aspects of this ladder. So at the very bottom of the ladder is a dictated curriculum. So essentially lecturers will just do everything at their students. So the opposite of what Evans just said in the chat, that all uh, learning teaching in the conservatoire is, is going to be collaborative. That probably wouldn't ever be the case uh, for you, Evan, whereas for perhaps this the old stage on the stage, the the crusty academic stood at the front lecturing, that would fit more down there. Whereas the, we're aiming towards, well, also Bovell and Bully say, a partnership curriculum, a negotiated curriculum. So not necessarily the very top of the ladder, the second rung down where there's a negotiation. And that negotiation, as I say, could be a bit more challenging uh, when carried out remotely. It can also be challenging because those kinds of negotiations can be fairly time consuming. and we can be reluctant to give up time, which we should be dedicating to course content, to have these kind of curricular pedagogical discussions with students. And some of the, the examples and tools we'll be sharing are, are ways to sort of make that a bit more efficient uh, as well, but that does sometimes come with a bit of a compromise that you might have to choose a level of co-creation, which is toward lower down this ladder than maybe you're aiming for, but might be more inclusive because it's allowing a broader scale engagement from a larger group of people. Uh, the the area that I, sorry, the, the if we go go back a bit, um, from what Stuart said, one one of the bits that brought me into this uh, and to work with Stuart sort of much more closely recently was some academics came to me asking about how to increase kind of Zoom uh, breakout rooms um, engagement, and 
one of the bits for me was asking the academics, have you asked the students what they want? Because a, a lot of it was kind of, what can we do as, as, as educators to make it more engaging and, and more exciting for the students? But actually, they hadn't really stopped to ask the students what the problem was and why they were disengaging in that part of the process. Um, while we didn't use audience response in this case, we did sit down with uh, some of the more sort of, again, proactive students and got some really useful feedback that allowed me to help design stuff for the wider university context. Um, but also help them to sort of shape their practice. One of the examples, for instance, was where they'd been doing um, role play previously. What they were doing was giving people script and they were just reading it off. And in a breakout room, the students felt no value in that. It's like I can read what I'm meant to know, but there was no kind of interaction to it. Whereas the activities that were, were quite challenging, they found really beneficial because they were able to work on them individually but as a group, if that makes sense. So they'd each take a part of that topic, look at it individually, but then come back and speak to each other in the breakout room. So it was interesting to hear this sort of the students talk about what they found useful and what they didn't find useful. And this sort of brought me to where we are now, which is when we're sort of starting a new term, actually people coming in, be it on campus, be it online, however that might be, we need that expectation to kind of be grounded for everyone what do the students expect from us what do we expect from the students but i think one of the big things was what the students expected from each other especially in the digital framework um so actually it was it was really interesting to have that conversation and it opened my eyes and obviously stuart um has done a lot of co-creative stuff previously and it was really useful to kind of get his expertise with what the the like i said the students had it sort of highlighted for me um so just just on that point there as well we can't assume what we we design is going to be welcomed by all students and again Stuart if you've got anything like you'd like to pick up on that one quickly um I definitely but I think in response to Hazel's uh, point in the chat which is something which um I think is a real advantage of the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about here because uh, a lot of the literature around co-creation if you you look into it like a lot of the good practice that's been shared out there it is often with those small groups of engaged students or is actually using audience response tools in the way that we're talking about you can scale that up to a larger group more effectively and i think sometimes it's a it's a self-selecting sample where you try and run something particularly if it's outside of the the timetable and outside of the curriculum to engage students in something to design it pe something pedagogic something curricular then you're only going to get the enthusiastic who come along and uh, exactly as you're saying hazel not necessarily those who would really benefit from these approaches whereas if you embed these things early which is why we've talked about this being co-creating expectations and if you're doing it remotely using these kinds of tools which don't have to be time consuming and we'll we'll move on to to show some examples in a minute then this is an effective way of trying to reach those the wider audience now it doesn't necessarily engage guarantee any ongoing engagement but that's where formalizing the kinds of expectations you set the kind of co-creation you do closing feedback loops so if you are creating things with students not just doing that and then taking it away feeding back about what's changed and revisiting these things to reinforce them but we can pick that up as we go through but 100 percent agree hazel that it's not representative of the small group uh, not a fan of padlet well uh, strap in we've got uh, we've got some of that coming up but we'll, we'll see how how that goes um in terms of where we've used this both in terms of our own practice but also supporting colleagues at portsmouth um setting expectations is one of the ones we're going to talk about most today because i think it's the most relevant for those kinds of issues around small groups not being inclusive but we've also used it to design assessment criteria, design the content that's being used as, as part of a syllabus, as part of a taught course, and also to design assessment. Now, I won't dwell too much on particularly the assessment design because anytime I do, it just turns into a long-winded discussion of quality assurance, which is not really relevant for what we're doing here. But just to say that we have examples where things have worked in quite a wide range of fields using these kind of remote co-creation tools. So we can maybe pick that up in the discussion later once we finish showing off the stuff, which is more about expectations. Tom. Um, so what we've got here at the moment is obviously we've been, been we use VBOX to start with and we're going to, as we say, look at Padlet. Um, 
but for for this kind of bit and for everyone's understanding of this any one of these tools that i've listed plus many more that i haven't can be used to apply the principles that stuart's talking about with co-creation um so emma's just put she can see them being useful in person um because of the anonymity yes but in person can also be online in person i don't know whether you're um sort of going on, on both sides of that now um but a lot of them like nearpod for instance uh can actually be used to embed it into like a moodle canvas blackboard uh site and, and can be sort of completed after the fact and again lots of those uh vles also have that have that, that kind of facility to um take some sort of response from an audience to to again draw in the the ideas that we're going to sort of go over and cover um so you take online to be in a different room we we've used uh nearpod and vivox um as we and and padlet actually as we have the license to all those really well in the different room scenario we haven't as yet done much necessarily in person i know for instance again within science who are big users of nearpod for us um they do a lot of things like draw it that they can annotate blood work and all the rest of it and share that within a an in-person classroom but they've also been able to carry that on uh for the different room or online scenario um but something we'll talk about in a minute which we we've used padlet for today but you could equally use uh, nearpod for and we'll, we'll kind of cover that in a minute jamboard i know a lot of ac our academics like jamboard for the fact that it's like a whiteboard but there's multiple slides and again comes with the whole google drive type suite for education um just to pick up on emma's point about being useful in person because absolutely no, nothing that we're going to talk about today necessarily has to be any different than if you did it in a classroom and i think that's that's what's quite good about this and to hazel's point earlier about how it can scale things up because the the engagement can be anonymous it can be in a room of two three hundred students if you wanted to um whereas sometimes it's challenging to, to manage those that engagement as i said that sometimes does still come with a compromise of how how deep the co-creation can be for want of a better term how meaningful the contributions from the students can be and absolutely hazel Paisel can uh, paddle can be tricky we'll pick some of that up in a minute because this isn't a uh, panacea it's uh, we're going to show some examples that have worked for us but there's there are challenges with large cohorts although potentially doing things in putting people in groups to break down the activity. So using multiple Padlets for, for different topics, for example, but then that restricts the, the extent to which you can respond to it in person, for example. So it might be about laying out this as an iterative process where the Padlet is used to gather feedback, which is then gone through afterwards, because you can't always respond on the fly to things. Also, just to save Evan's question about persuading academic colleagues, that's quite a big one to get into. So we'll try and come back to that at the end, if that's all right. <laughs> so um back to the the vbox if you've still got the app open uh, it's a 10 second uh, timer on this one just a, a quick one with a question of uh Bobo and bully uh, and colleagues outlined a type a typology of roles that students adopt in co-creation what are they or where are they so you can have up to four you can do more than one did 10 seconds and it's obviously not long enough. Um, so apologies for that. I thought that would be long enough. And this is one of those bits where when you're designing things, I'm sure many of you have, what seems like a, a quick time to keep things moving may not be quite long enough when you're actually in practice. The answer is all of them. Uh, so all, all of them were correct. Uh, but this is purely an example to get us onto um, the next point of, of where this sits on the co-creative ladder, Stuart. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure many of you here have used similar quizzes in taught sessions you've done, particularly over the last 18 months, but but generally. So the, the idea of running a quiz itself is hardly revolutionary uh, to us, but what we wanted to flag up as its potential for co-creation from a different, a couple of different perspectives. Now, the first uh, way of exploring this is that it's useful as a, as a knowledge check, but that can be from a co-creative point of view can involve you having to be on your toes quite a lot. So, so using this, it's sort of you can see on the ladder we've indicated this would be one of the lower levels. So it wouldn't be 
anywhere near partnership necessarily, but it would be moving away from just a dictated curriculum. And this works quite nicely with flipped learning, for example, if you have some content you're delivering online in advance of a synchronous live session, whether in person or, or online or however you may want to deliver it, then these kinds of knowledge checks about the, the subject matter can identify where the cold spots in your students' knowledge is. So you can respond by shifting the content to be about where they're struggling and perhaps dropping others which you know they're gathering they're, they're covered well they understand well already so the co-creation doesn't feel perhaps hugely authentic in that regard because the students don't necessarily have a say in where it's going but on the other hand they they sort of do because they're letting you know what they need based on how well they've performed in the quiz um but as i said that means you have to be quite hot on changing what you're going to cover this would work quite well perhaps for kicking off more of a seminar discussion than it would something quite practical or something that, which is very perhaps theory rich or very content heavy so you could explore topics uh, around the topics this might work better in say the humanities or social sciences perhaps than it would as from some other disciplines um so we're saying this is not necessarily about competition as some of the the quizzes are i always think of kahoot when the neopod has the one where you climb up the mountain doesn't it it's not about the time to climb yes Thank you. <laughs> it's not about particular students doing better than others. It's about trying to identify consensus where there's cold spots in the knowledge or where things are already very well covered. So you don't have to spend your time doing it. Now, also quizzes like this can be used as a kind of informal poll for temperature check about what people might want out of the curriculum. So you might build in some optionality to your sessions and say, we have three or four options of what we could talk about today which do you want to cover most and then use that to to vote on it which again would probably be a little bit more create co-creative but perhaps less of the actual authenticity because students might just pick topics they're interested in they may not be ones that they're struggling with they need the support quite so much so using a quite simple quiz which i'm sure many of us have used uh, a lot recently can be used in a couple of different ways to facilitate a bit more growth around co-creation whether that's letting choosing students choose what they want or you choosing what students need based on how well they've performed in their knowledge and when i say letting students choose what they want i sort of alluded to content but I, that could also apply to pedagogical approaches it could be would you rather have this as a live session would you rather have a five minute video, a 10 minute video about this uh, or, or what have you. So you can control those choices. So it's still sort of towards the bottom of the ladder. It's quite prescribed, but you're giving some students some say, some optionality and some sense of investment that they're getting what they want. Again, obviously, assuming that you eventually do deliver that. And Emma's point about fitting into a very structured course is something we could perhaps pick up later on because uh, that's another one which could could run for a while. But we have had some colleagues who, who do that kind of thing, which we can uh, draw on later. Tom, anything to, to add on this one? Or nope, already no, there. no, not at, not at the moment. Uh, but again, if we get any other questions about this as we go, please do um, uh, come back to us with it. Uh, so we have a uh, a Padlet that I will put in the chat um, if you wish to join. This is um, a, a, a theoretical one uh, as, as an idea, but it's uh, these are three learning objectives that you can see on screen that are for a, a module. Um, and what the idea is, is the students can tie their answer to which learning objective they think works well, what they'd like changed. And it's that uh, kind of notion that they can sort of upvote certain things they 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 put weight in they can and again with Padlet we've just done an up and down vote but you can actually score it up to a hundred if you want to be really granular with that. Um, it, this is more again just to kind of if for those that haven't maybe used Padlet before to have a go at adding something and, and tying it to an objective. So you click the pink uh, button, we'll get a new uh, thing, a uh, new box up. Uh, add a new response and once you've added your response you get the three little dots and you can do connect to a post and I can choose to connect it to a post and then we can move it around and you can see what is, is tied to that so again this doesn't have to be done as live 
Um, it could be um, put into your your VLE into into how and it just into an email, and they can do this asynchronously as well. It doesn't have to be live. But the nice bit, I think, as uh, Hazel mentioned, um, is you you have the anonymity side of it, and people then kind of start to engage when they see things happening on screen, because they're doing it together. If they're asked to do after the fact, sometimes, and I'm sure we've all seen it, where there's a little bit of a, a tail off of yes, you get the um, the few people actually joining in with this, but then you'll get loads who maybe don't if they're not doing it live. This will allow people to do that. Now, someone mentioned uh, one of the problems with Padlet can be the, the size and, and scope of the space. I know one academic, I don't have it to hand, um, but she'd done uh, the, sort of the column format and at the top of each column had placed every student's name. And what they were using it for was to share design and textile ideas. So they were using it very much in that they populate with their ideas and their kind of like someone mentioned photos of their work little videos of um, models they'd made whatever the the sort of subject had been and they could build up a portfolio within that that everyone could see so you can see everyone else's idea around the subject and actually it was a really good way um to get people to to engage in the process and it got more people doing it because they got inspiration from other people's posts you could see when people had posted you could see who had done something first so there's no, there was no real plagiarism in effect, but there was a lot of sharing of ideas and a lot of sharing of ide uh, things. So yes, um, it was, it was a really good text I was on. Emma, uh, feel free to contact me afterwards, and I'll uh, speak to the lecturer and see if she's happy for me to share uh, the Padlet app as an example for your your people. But it's it's that kind of idea that I think where pa Padlet is really strong is that there are lots of different ways that it can be used if you if you if you're lucky enough to have the paid for version you can have multiple boards as well but they even on the free version of padlet you can use like the wall one i have here but you can, you've also got timeline you've got the map version and that's a really good one not so much in co-creative things but just as a an icebreaker at times like where do you like to go on holiday or where are you from so you can build a picture of where everyone that's taking part that day um is, is, is good uh yeah so the drawn tasks where if you're drawing take a photo and upload it um obviously within a nearpod there is a draw it feature which is where we did this kind of uh idea before we had a few uh, uh learning objectives up and people annotated it on screen and shared those with us in the same idea that we're doing here using padlet and i think that's my point of we have lots of different tools and you you'll have different tools to us at your institutions or with, wherever you work um but that doesn't mean to say that any one tool is better than another. It's 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 purely about taking the idea and adapting it ever so slightly in a new way to get the same results and to get that co-creative element uh, in there. Stuart, have you got anything you'd like to pick up? Yeah, I, I think it depends on how you structure these kinds of activities. They usually have to come with quite clear instructions of what you find most important. So uh, we had a, a point earlier in the chat about doing Padlet with a, a huge uh, cohort of 500 students. Now, that might be where you won't really strongly emphasize things like the the voting, the, the, the thumbs up. You could say, if someone's put an idea you like, then just upvote it or downvote it if you, if you disagree. Uh, so rather than having 500 people all putting their own original thoughts, you've got, uh, you're getting a clearer idea of what that consensus is. Um, but it, this very very simple activity where we've just thrown up some learning objectives and then just asked for opinions on them you can already see you've got some good ideas have come through where like you're talking about the language being unclear and what have you and how perhaps it's too limited we're not looking at research methods we're just looking at uh, specific topics and this is exactly what we did with this uh, exercise these are learning objectives from a module I teach on and that's there's quite a lot of diversity in how you can take this from a co-creation perspective you can say from one side of things this is just for clarification so we could essentially go no further than this I could just look at all the comments and say okay some of the language is off-putting let's unpack some of the ideas so I'll explain what some of the terminology means and that's particularly important because, um, as a few people have alluded to, sometimes co-creation is a bit at odds with quality assurance and not necessarily in terms of what the aims of quality assurance are, more the timeframes of things that you might need to get your 
your modules approved months before you even see a student, of course, so particularly with assessment. So this can be just useful for clarification. You might not be able to change these learning outcomes, but you can explain things that are ambiguous. You can then also explain how they relate to the assessment design, for example. Uh, but you can also use this for future looking for that's no good for the kind of co-creation and the expectations that we're talking about now but you can co-create for future cohorts you can say well we got a lot of feedback that learning objective two was a bit ambiguous didn't talk about research methods enough so you can change it for the next cohort and feed that back to both cohorts to keep the the co-creation going uh, between different groups uh, that you have come on board but if you do have the capacity to change things based on this then that's even better because you can send back drafts of whatever has been uh, overviewed back to the students say okay you told us this wasn't clear and this isn't specifically just about learning outcomes it could be about anything you can say so we've changed it for this reason or most of you voted to say this was the most common problem so we fixed xyz so this is a bit like getting feedback but feels a bit more agile and a bit more personalized to areas where you think the students would need that kind of support? Um, Anything else? Just to pick a, few, pick a few things up from the comments of uh, GDPR being one. Uh, for us, it's not been a real problem because of how we use Padlet and our students uh, are separated by a different domain. So Stuart and myself are at port.ac.uk for our email, but our students are at my port. Within Padlet, the students in this are actually staff so they only the staff have access to the, the sort of the front end students have to come in and, and basically can't post with a name to it it is only anonymous even if they they can't they just physically can't log in because of using the the backpack account um so if they like i think emma put in the, in the chat as well we wouldn't ask them to share personal details like I say, I know some academics have you know, put like their names on the top, um, but it has done that under discussion with the students and no one's had a problem because it's essentially a private board. Um, but yes, there for us, it hasn't been a problem, but I can see that if, if their people are logging in um, and, and sharing names, although you can set the board to be anonymous anyway. So it, it can be a tricky one, but it's not one that we've had to worry about. Um, and I think, uh, yes, uh, being uh, Hazel's put about students being put into groups and disliking being put into groups by us. One of the bits um, that came of the the conversation that I had with science was kind of a halfway house to that, especially at the with the more um, online based uh, sort of delivery at the moment. Because in in a classroom, they may be just on sat on a table and not know anyone, but that's your group and you just have to get on with it. They may not like it, but they'll get on with the task. The difference of, of that in a breakout room is that they won't necessarily talk and people don't turn the camera on and it stays quiet. The bit we came across was students put themselves into pairs or threes. And if they were doing a group as uh, maybe a five or a six, you'd mix the, the, the you mix the pairs up so that they're with someone that they don't mind talking to. So Stuart and I would be put together, but then we'd be put with uh, sort of Hazel and Sam just picking two random names up the, the chat that we don't know their friends. But actually, together we work as a four. So you've got a bit of a mix of not them choosing everything, but actually giving them some sort of ownership of knowing someone in the group to promote that discussion. Uh, so thank you for taking part. Quite, uh, I was just going to say, following up on that, Tom, that um, a lot of the kind of things we're talking about are quite useful to do very, very early on. So before students get stuck in particular patterns or friendship groups or what have you, I think where we wanted to focus on how you could set expectations about different activities here is doing that as early as possible means that you might get less of that resistance, particularly I'm thinking with level four students or uh, where they're new to university teaching anyway putting them in groups uh, in that way where they might be more open to talking to each other than they are to talking to you because they might be a bit more nervous though I may be being uh, optimistic around that but the sooner you can use this to maybe set expectations and one of the things we have been using these kinds of tools for are just saying how people will engage so getting students to say okay we 
we will turn up and have our microphones uh, on when needed or not and engaging in why you're doing those things. So it's surfacing some of the challenges that are coming up in the chat early on with students to discuss the benefits or challenges of engagement they may find. Yes, uh, I, I, I think from what Stuart was saying there as well, to Hazel's comment, of some of the students, especially level four now, may not even know anyone because they haven't had a chance to meet anyone else yet. Um, so it, it, it's again that expectation conversation of how many of you know each other, how many of you come from the same institution, or how many of you have got friends already, and 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 start with that conversation before you start, like you say, presuming things. Uh, so the. I think we've kind of uh, done this, but uh, Stuart, it, this is the the sort of the next stage the stage up on the ladder where you're drawing or sharing things on the screen. Um, is there anything else you'd like to sort of bring out from that? No, no, uh, I, I think we've covered it and you've summed it up mostly there, Tom. Um, it is moving up further because it's more generative. It is getting ideas from students. It's then, I suppose, how you follow through on those and the important part of where you might situate this on a, on a ladder of uh, of co-creation. Um, but as Tom alluded to earlier, this I find doing this in a uh, synchronous session quite effective because, as we've seen from just the example that where you guys have been posting on the Padlet, you can flag up things that are unclear, which can be just clarified immediately. So it doesn't have to be a long drawn out process. You can say, well, this is what we mean. So this is what you should do in your assessment if it's about learning outcomes. Whereas you can do it asynchronously. Engagement, I find, tends to be a bit lower asynchronously, um, but also it's perhaps a bit more transparent. You can just leave it on your VLE page in perpetuity and people can refer back to it and what have you. So, this uh, is slightly longer. It's a, a, a free text box. Um, but what areas of your practice would do you think would work best for co-creation? So this is again, you should have a, a sort of free box to start typing the answers. So all that countdown timer sort of goes on. I don't think I've seen the timer before. I'm, I'm not even responding and I'm finding it stressful. So. <laughs> I apologies for the, for the stress <laughs> cause. Um, yeah, it, it was, it was a, a bit I found within the, in the, the PowerPoint plugin to, to Evox. You can, you can set a timer to kind of automate the process and keep people on track. Cause it's one of those bits where if you were doing this as like we were referring to with the quiz idea, um, you could, like you would do with Kahoot, set a, a, a timer per question so that you're trying to keep yourself on track you're not sort of letting it run um sort of wildly off base uh, if you need to so that's about half the time for those that are responding and appreciate uh what people are saying now as i say today we've used sort of a mixture of powerpoint with the vvox plugin uh, and padlet because we are lucky enough to have both of those at the university this purely is an idea of, of, as we say, concept rather than specific tools. We're, we're not trying to sell one over the other. You could do all of these things in multiple different audience response systems, um, which again, you sort of may be bringing up as we go now. Other audience response systems are available. And uh, I, I think I, I think if we're comparing them as, as people have been in the chat, which is interesting to see and people talking about, um, uh, poll everywhere which I, I had used years ago but haven't for a while I think I tend to like Nearpod because I think it does a bit of everything but I don't think its individual versions are quite as good as some of the the more standouts who specialize in things but I think Tom and I have had a very long conversation about this in the past this and Godzilla but that's another story <laughs> So the problem I have with, with the v, the VVox plug into this, and I know why it is what it is, but it just shows data capture. So I have to actually bring in VVox and present that full screen to uh, show the results of that particular question. There we are. So uh, uh, VLE staff uh, for in training, discovering new topics, online sessions, 
curriculum delivery, the content is relatively set, but the format can be elastic, balance of learning types, uh, flow of the topics, establishing lists of useful links, resources, and focus groups and feedback sessions on VLA design. Uh, so obviously, while we've been talking at it in, in terms of staff student, which again, I know many people here will be supporting, actually it really highlights that you could use this as well from the, the people like myself, where we're, like I say, you're asking for VLE design thoughts on that and, and, and the iterative process that we have to go through in terms of training and improvements for both staff and students. You can offer some, some really useful things out there uh, through that as well. And it, depending on how big your social media reach is, uh, I know that we've got a fairly proactive sort of Twitter um, and Instagram profile on uh, Fatel Portsmouth. Um, you could put things up there to to again get some feedback for from students you may not normally have access to it again it depends on how many of the students follow you as a maybe an internal department but some really uh, really good kind of um information and feedback there what that goes to here though is is the collaboration space we were using that one in the kind of fully open collaborative collaborative idea where people could put anything they like down um, again this could very well be a, a padlet space um, or like the nearpod collaborate board uh, or a free text answer could be a google drive microsoft one one drive that kind of everyone has access to write whatever they like um, and and it can be used to generate ideas as well as get get feedback from uh, from things as, as Stuart will i'm sure go on to though the guidance for these sort of activities has to be very, very clear because it can go off topic quite quickly and quite wildly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, this is probably closer to that version of quite generative dialogic discussions with students that certainly what I think of when I think of co-creation, because you're you're getting a much more open view of in their own words about what they want. but depending on who the audience is, that's going to have to be structured and scaffolded in different ways. And the, the question that you ask is is much more important here than the tool you use, in my opinion. Although, as we said, some tools will allow you to use images, which might be useful or more inclusive at times. But um, with an audience like yourselves, where you're all very well informed, you know what we're talking about, we can probably leave it quite broad and you'll come up with some, some interesting responses. And someone mentioned on the, on the, the board then that they, that their students are our staff, uh, which is the same for myself. Uh, so you you know what's going to be understood more effectively. Whereas if you're coming with perhaps some level four students in the first week of their studies, you're going to have to think carefully about how you structure co-creative discussions. And that might mean that you naturally limit what they want. If you just throw it wide open, kind of wild west assessment design to some first years without really explaining why you're doing that, then that could be counterproductive or they just might not have the pedagogic literacy to come up with ideas that are going to be useful so you might need to do some unpacking of some concepts around that but also i am a big defender of just asking students what they want and seeing what happens it doesn't always mean that you have to follow through on it but um again some of these tools they allow you to vote for more popular ideas i think that is one in nearpod if we're comparing arbitrary favorites of, of our tools this is a few people saying in the the the, the chat because i think you can say you can then get students to come up with their own ideas and other students can latch onto it and say yes that would work for me as well in a quite an, an effective way and it that way it moves a bit more up the ladder where you're not really having much of a a reign over what's happening at all you're sort of saying here is a specific area what would you want to see and that can be content it can be delivery style it can be assessment it can be something more structural and this can be used sort of in validation of programs perhaps to develop new ideas for for how a course might look with a cognate group of students or perhaps some graduates that kind of thing that can be trickier audiences to reach but slightly going off topic here uh the the conversation between emma and hazel in the chat has resonated very closely to my heart of, of tool selection um as I mentioned, we we are lucky enough to have Nearpod, Vivox, and Padlet, as well as the Google stuff that comes with the the fact we're at the moment a Google institution. Um, but the, the the three there that are more traditionally thought of as audience response tools, we we try to uh, offer uh, academics 
a, a range of different things. However, the, 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 the big one of defending favorite tools, one of our colleagues who is a, a super lovely chap is a big Mentimeter fan. And I have been batting my head against a brick wall trying to get him onto the, the VVOX train because we have it. And, and so that his, his best practice is shown with, with tools that we have access to. And he agrees. But when you're trying to learn a new tool, a lot of it can just be, I know how it works in this one. It's the first, like for me, like, like I say, Nearpod was the one I first saw. So it's kind of the, the one I'm most used to using. Um, so I, I'll always be a, like Stuart because I indoctrinated him early. Um, I got him into Nearpod. So it's what we both know. I'm lucky that I've been able to get it kind of implemented for people to use and have some good use cases and examples uh, through colleagues to sort of, sort of help promote that tool. But Mentimeter is a fantastic one. It was just more than we could afford when doing other bits and pieces. But I think, yes, personal preference is, is, it tends to be down to what you found first, what you learned, and then not wanting to have to relearn how to do it another way. One of the other arguments we get a lot of is what happens if you stop paying for this one and it goes to free. So if people are already using a free version they're happy with, at least then they know not much is gonna change because of that, because it's already free. It's, it's a battle I think people who, who do learning technology, learning design are always gonna be fighting. I think it's just that bit of, what I've, I've worked out with Stuart is, is we can offer what we can offer and we can try and make it as easy for people to use certain tools if they haven't had an access to them before. I think a lot of the time that we need to almost take that step back and be system agnostic to what is it you're trying to do and how can we make that work for you in the tool that you have? We have this one, it's paid for and you can do it here, but if you're not gonna do that one, well, how do I make this happen for you in Mentimeter? And it's, it's that sort of- time, I think just to bring it back to the co-creation, I think this is a useful lens for people who are in a kind of uh, learning technologist, academic developer role, because co-creation, what we've, the point we've tried to emphasize through today is less about the tools, it's about, this is a, a kind of reframing of what they might be for, thinking about how you can use things you might be used to already for a different purpose, to achieve a different goal. And actually, if you're supporting colleagues to do that, using co-creation as the, the starting point, not using Mentimeter or Neopod as the starting point can be a very useful way of getting people to rethink because you might it might serve a very different purpose and as we we picked up from a few people in the chat there may be inclusivity questions and basically people want to share images because it's it's more uh it, it's how they want to engage with that activity but you might not be able to do that on one of the tools in which case if you're facilitating engagement more effectively you would need a particular tool for that reason So to, to summarize before we have a, a sort of a few questions and one last question from us, as Stuart just said their co-creation is more of a principle uh, than a specific sort of practice and audience response uh, can be used to facilitate that um, and work depending on the tool you use nicely in a large group uh, sort of area. Uh, rethinking of the tools and the practices you may already have to fit that. Um, and it's, it's as, as, as mentioned in the chat, trying to find ways to engage students, but it depends on, on, on them and what they want to engage with, um, which again, can be part of that co-creative of, of sort of nature of, do you want it to be email? Do you want it to be Facebook? Do you want it to be Moodle chat, Canvas forum boards, whatever the um, sort of means might be. Stuart, have you got anything else before we ask our last question? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, so this one's 30 seconds um, and to go back to that point of the, someone in the chat earlier saying they didn't like Padlet. Um, have you ever tried co-creation? Uh, so if you've still got your VVox app open, uh, the code is still 109647302. Um, have you, uh, having heard what we've said, have you actually tried co-creation and maybe didn't realise you've done it? And then we'll have hopefully a couple of minutes for any questions that people may want to throw our way. While people are reflecting on whether we've uh, made them think about what they've done might be co-creation, I'll come back to the question earlier from, uh, I, I think it was Evan, but it feels a long time ago now, um, about how you encourage colleagues to actually engage in it in the first place. Um, and we're, the reason we're sharing this practice now is because we had, 
and it certainly was by no means blanket success at Portsmouth. I, I'm not, we're not trying to claim that everybody now co-creates everything with students all the time, but we sort of saw an opportunity with the shift to online learning due to COVID that a lot of our colleagues, some of them doing some very innovative practice, some of them who had been teaching for a very long time and doing a very good job of it, everyone was sort of all back to square one to some degree, or maybe felt like that. And actually, um, co-creation, we, we managed to pitch as not a solution, but one of the ways you could address those concerns that you could, that if you didn't know if your usual learning and teaching or something new you wanted to try were going to be well received by students, then asking them. And that could be about content, it could be about curriculum, because you might want to focus on different topics in different ways. Then having a having a co-created approach in any of the ways we talked about or others then quite a few people latched on to that and used it quite early on to formalize things and we, we built a lot of guidance around that for colleagues about how you can formalize expectations so to bring it back around to co-creating expectations as a topic we had people who would write sort of learning partnership agreements where they would talk about the responsibilities that students would have and staff would have about their engagement for example so that's more co-creating engagement than it is the actual activities but as i said i'm not claiming that we had a hundred percent enthusiasm from staff at, or students for that matter for, for co-creation but i think using these tools for just very briefly for for small co-created interventions or just sometimes just to get dialogues going has proven effective in lots of different areas of the institution and and the bit we found is is it's as stuart said at the beginning it works slightly better when you're setting it as an actual expectation at the beginning of a course than it does trying to pick it up halfway through or three quarters of the way through when you're, you're sort of getting nearer exam times or supporting that kind of um, assessment where you're fighting a battle to get people back on board. It's, it's easier to maintain that engagement if you have a good conversation to start with. And the idea, hopefully, is that these tools offer different ways to facilitate that conversation for those that maybe are quieter or don't want to speak up but they'll press a button on screen um ed's put a, a comment of an, an early bad experience with a tool can have a negative impact uh, which is is very true and i think we've probably all seen that um one of the bits i saw at digifest not the last online one but the, the last one we basically it was about march just as the pandemic was about to hit um and I saw a speaker there say something that resonated to me, which is the the current Gen Z of students aren't frightened by technology. For them, it's if it doesn't work, it's not me that it's not working it, it's that the tool's terrible and they'll ditch it. And it can be very hard to get them back on board after that. Whereas maybe some older people um, will say oh it's it, i can't work this but maybe but i'm a technophobe it's not it's not the, the system it's just i don't know how to use it and they can all equally disengage and it, but it's, it's quite interesting to hear the approach of one person blaming themselves and the other person blaming the tech but either way you're going to get some dropout um so it, it's being very careful with with that so uh, at that point uh, does anyone have any questions thank you very much for those who have attended and are dropping off does anyone have any last questions before we wrap it up hopefully we've covered most of the questions as we go through uh yes yeah, thank you uh, emma nice to see you as even though you're, you're just a photo this time but nice to see you again as well if you do want to get in contact with us um it's tom.langston at port.ac.uk um if you, you want to send an email to me and I'll, we'll offer any sort of help that we can going forward. Glad to hear in the comments and uh, that's quite useful, particularly as based on the last question, a lot of you have done quite a lot of co-creation already. So we're very much of the mind that we just wanted to get people thinking about things they're probably already doing, but different ways that you can do them. So and thank you for uh, the interesting discussion in the chat throughout as well. Yeah, so sometimes it's just nice to know that you're not alone in, in the battle. <laughs> sometimes it's nice to know that everyone else is fighting the same fight and it's not you, it's just how things are. Thank you, Thomas Stewart. It was a really interesting session. If you're happy for me to end the recording now, I'll go ahead and do so. Yeah. Perfect.